In the Torah portion we just read this past Shabbos, Lech Lecha, we have the Brisbane Absarim, the famous covenant of the parts in which God solidified his irrevocable and eternal covenant with Abraham, stating once more that it would be to his descendants that the land of Israel will be given as an eternal inheritance. We read in Genesis chapter 15, God said to him, Bring for me a young cow, a goat, a ram, a dove, and a pigeon. Abraham brought all these for him. He split them in half and placed one half opposite the other. The bird, however, he did not split. Vultures descended on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. When the sun was setting, Abraham fell in a trance, and he was stricken by a deep, dark dread. The sun set, and it became very dark. A smoking furnace with a flaming fire passed between the halves of the animals. On that day, God made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the Egyptian river, as far as the great river, the Euphrates. There's enormous amount of symbolism in this eternal covenant that God forged with our forefather Abraham. We'll discuss one of them that I think is incredibly relevant today. God was telling Abraham that being his chosen people is a huge and difficult responsibility. In order that they inherit the land of Israel and dwell there in security until the end of time, and from there to lead the entire world to perfection, unity, and selflessness, they will need to be on a very high moral and spiritual level. There needs to be a system in place to bring out the best in them. They will need to go through four stages of being subjugated and controlled by non-Jewish empires who will make life miserable for them. And they will need to emerge from this incredible long saga, overcoming unimaginable difficulties. The cow, the goat and the ram represent the empires of Babylon, Persia and Greece. As for the two birds, one of them represents the Roman slash Christian slash Western empires, and the other represents the Arab slash Islamic empires. They are both similar, they're both doves, because they both emerged from the same source, Judaism. The smoke and the flaming fire represent God who appears often in scripture in a pillar of smoke, and the fire represents the Jewish soul. The Jews will have to go through terrible experiences from these empires, who will attempt to extinguish their flame, but the Jewish fire will continue to burn bright and never be extinguished, because God will be with them and never abandon them. The splitting of the animals was meant to symbolize that all these empires will cease to be relevant before the Messiah comes. The Babylonian, Persian, and Greek empires exist only in Wikipedia. And we are currently witnessing the demise of Western civilization, which is the downfall of the fourth beast prophesied in the book of Daniel and the book of Obadiah and in many other places throughout the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible. We spoke about this several times in previous videos. Vultures descended on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. The vultures represent the righteous king of the Davidic dynasty, the ancestors of the Messiah who attempted to devour the animals representing the four empires so that the Jews do not have to suffer so long under their dominion. Abraham sent them away because he knew that this was a necessary prerequisite for the Jews to merit to live in the land of Israel forever. Then the verse says that he split all the animals, but one of the birds he left whole. Why did he leave one of the birds intact? To understand this, I need to share with you an unbelievable discussion in the Holy Zohar, in the section of Vo'era, the second section of the book of Exodus. It's on page 32a in a classic edition of the Zohar, and on page 335 in the Masuk Midvash edition, which is very popular. The Zohar was first published in the 13th century, but it was written about a thousand years earlier. In any case, even eight centuries ago, it would have been impossible to predict what I'm about to share with you. The Zohar says that Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Yossi were taking a walk. Rabbi Chia was lost in his thoughts. 
Rabbi Yossi asked him to share what he was so preoccupied with. Rabbi Chiyo let out a deep moan of sorrow and began to weep. He said that it was revealed to him that Abraham's prayer for his son Yishmoel will be a source of great suffering for the Jewish people at the end of days. As recorded in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham and Sarah were very old. Abraham was 98 and Sarah was 89. God then appeared to Abraham and told him that he will have a son from his wife Sarah who will be the one from whom the chosen people will emerge. Abraham already had a son from his Egyptian wife Hagar. He actually had no interest in marrying her, but Sarah insisted. She was Sarah's domestic helper. She was the daughter of the Egyptian pharaoh. She witnessed firsthand the miracles God had performed when he struck Pharaoh's entire household with a plague until Sarah was released back to her husband, as described in chapter 12. She decided it would be better for her to be a handmaid in the house of Abraham rather than be an Egyptian princess. When Sarah was getting older and she feared she would never have a child, she encouraged Abraham to marry her, and Sarah would raise her child like her very own. But when God told Abraham that the son that will be his heir will be born to Sarah, Abraham's gut reaction was one of apprehensiveness. Perhaps, in his humility, he felt that he wasn't worthy of such an amazing miracle to have Sarah bear him a child at this advanced age. He suggested to God to perform a smaller miracle and inspire Yishmael to follow in his righteous ways. The fact that he loved his son and wanted him, to, wanted him to succeed was very normal. But his request from God that Yishmael should be his heir would have very painful consequences. Rabbi Chia went on to explain that the guardian angel of Yishmael was insisting for 400 years that Abraham's initial request regarding Yishmael be fulfilled. He reasoned to God that being that the bris mila, circumcision, is a prerequisite to inherit the land of Israel, and the descendants of Yishmael do perform circumcision, so they too should inherit the land. Finally, for some reason, God acquiesced, but with a caveat. God clarified, the circumcision of the Yishmaelites is not complete. It is not done properly, and it is not done on the eighth day. But nonetheless, they will have control of the Holy Land, but they will never succeed to make it into anything. During the entire duration that the land is controlled by the Muslims, it will be a backwater, mostly desolate and uninhabited, and they will have to vacate the land when the time comes for the Jews to return. The Zohar goes on to say that the Muslims will not leave without fighting with all their might to stop the Jews from taking control of the Holy Land. This is an absolutely amazing prophecy. The Muslims indeed controlled the land of Israel from the 7th century onwards, except for about a hundred years when Jerusalem was controlled by the Crusaders. In the 13th century, when the Zohar was published, there was no movement whatsoever for Jews to return in mass to the Holy Land and take control of it. So obviously, this was a divine prophecy which refers to our generation. And the fact that we just witnessed the single most vicious and sadistic attack on the Jews in Eretz Yisrael by the Yishmaelites in the entire history of our encounters with Yishmael is an indication that they are about to be booted out of the entire land from sea to sea. And their guardian angel knows that, and he aroused them to fight it off with all the savagery and barbaric bloodthirst they could muster. Now we could understand why Abraham could not be the one to cut the bird which represented Islam in half, because it was his mistake that empowered Islam to seize control of the Holy Land and fight with all their might to stop the Jews from returning. Abraham was later forced to ignore his compassion for his son Yishmael when God told him to listen to his wife Sarah and throw him and his mother out of the house because Yishmael was terrorizing her son Isaac, as recorded in chapter 21 but the damage had already been done. Our forefathers and mothers were not only physical progenitors of the Jewish people, more so. Their lives and actions programmed the DNA of the Jewish people. 
they planted the seeds and served as micro-generators for experiences which their descendants would endure. Their passionate devotion to God was implanted in the core of the Jewish soul for all eternity and served as the inextinguishable fire which kept us going through the darkest of times and their experiences were amplified and projected upon their descendants in the future. But in the same way, mistakes they made, even when not at the fault, and due to the limitations of just being human, nonetheless, being that they were in the developing and embryonic state of the Jewish DNA, every minor imperfection was severely magnified as it reached its full expression. Abraham's compassion for his son Yishmael, which again was only human, but nonetheless it was an omen for the future, that the Jews misplaced compassion on their Islamic enemies will cause them enormous misfortune. Feeding the sadistic monsters of Gaza with food, water, and energy for 20 years, allowing billions to flow in from all over the world, allowing tens of thousands of them to work in Israel and bring back 10 times what they could have earned in Gaza, allowing in millions of ton of concrete with which they built their war tunnels, allowing their fishermen to use the waters near the coast, which was apparently how they smuggled in the, smuggled in the materials to create over 20,000 missiles to terrorize the Jews all over Israel, and treating their sick in our hospitals. Yiyas Sinwar, Yimach Shemay, the monster who organized the entire horrific massacre of Simchas Torah was in Israeli prison when he developed brain cancer. Out of severe misplaced sense of morality, Israeli doctors saved his life instead of letting this monster rot. Israel also treated many of his family members. All these and many, many more acts of misplaced compassion nourished the monsters who repaid us with the Simchas Torah atrocities. My point is not to criticize. I only want to point out that all this is in the prophecies and has been predetermined, and that the reason why it is now that we experienced the ferocious, merciless venom of Islam exploding with such unimaginable, savage, voracious barbarity. It is exactly as the Holy Zohar predicts that the Jews are about to repossess the land of Israel from sea to sea and the Muslims are fighting like crazy to try to stop it. There's, there's an amazing story recorded at the end of Tractate Makos, page 24b. Rabbi Akiva, one of the greatest sages who ever lived, who witnessed the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70, and lived through a second destruction at the time of Bar Kokhba. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were savagely massacred each of those times by the Romans. He was walking with his colleagues past the site of the destroyed temple on the Temple Mount, and they saw a fox strolling around on the very place of the Holy of Holies. They began to cry, but Rabbi Akiva smiled. They asked him, Why are you smiling? Rabbi Akiva said, There are two prophecies linked together, one in the book of Micha, chapter 3, verse 12. Tzion, Soda, Techoresh, Virushalayim, Iyem, Tia, Vahar Habayis, Levomais, Yar. Jerusalem will be turned into rubble heaps, and the Temple Mount will remain as desolate as the most secluded regions of the forest where only wild animals roam. And there is another prophecy about the glory of Jerusalem. In Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 4, Koyamar Hashem Tzavokais, Oid Yeshvi Zekedim, Vizekedim, Zekedim, Zekedim, Said Rabbi Akiva, Now that we witnessed the first prophecy, I know for certain that we will experience the latter. This is what his colleagues answered him, Akiva Nichamtonu, Akiva Nichamtonu, you have consoled us. The story is explained by great Jewish sages as follows. Rabbi Akiva obviously never doubted that all the prophecies regarding the redemption will be fulfilled. However, there is no limit to how great things can be after Mashiach comes. So although he knew for certain that things will be awesome, he did not know to what extent. When he witnessed the level of degradation and shame we suffered, that the Holy Temple was not only destroyed, but degraded to, degraded to the lowest point, at that point he realized that if God fulfills the sad prophecies in the most terrible way possible, then for certain he will fulfill the good prophecies in the best possible way. 
Now that we have witnessed the terrible fulfillment of the horrific prophecies in Zechariah that we spoke about in the previous two videos, as well as the prophecy of the Zohar which we discussed in this video, we are certain that we will shortly witness amazing things for the Jewish people and for the world. Yeshua is Hashem, Keherifayin, the salvation of God comes like the blink of an eye.